One way to increase your speed and power is to build more muscle. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before we go pumping iron like crazy, there's another way. My name's Naomi. I'm a chem bioengineer by training. I analyze brainwave data and I'm a black belt. You're thinking karate, aren't you? Have you heard of mixed martial arts? Yeah, that stuff. Now today, we're going to dive into the science behind speed and power. These are super important in just about every sport. If you can outpace your opponent, then you have a good chance of winning. So how do you train speed and power? Well, before we get into the training, we should probably figure out what power even is. How is it different from speed? So, okay, what's power? Well, power, in a physics standpoint, is force times displacement over time. Some of you might be groaning right now, I know, I know. This will be quick though, and it's totally worth learning. Our mini physics lesson of the day, okay? So what is force in this equation? Well, let's take a look at a push-up. You can hold the push at the bottom. This is called an isometric hold, where you're contracting your muscles and holding a static position. In this case, you're neither falling to the floor nor pushing away from the ground. You're applying the exact amount of force needed to keep yourself stationary. Since you aren't moving, the force you're applying is exactly equal to the force pushing you down. Well, how much force is that? It's your mass, your body's mass, times the acceleration of Earth's gravity. That's how much force you're having to push into the ground to hold yourself up. Now, this is technically your weight, what you would see if you step on a scale. Weight is truly your mass times the acceleration of gravity. If you were way out in outer space, your weight would be zero because that tug of Earth's gravity is basically negligible. But the vast majority of us live on Earth, so we'll always be experiencing this force. So the next time someone says to you, may the force be with you, you can say, unfortunately, it's always with me. Now, what if you applied even more force and you pushed up out of that position? Now you'd be doing work. Work is the force that you're applying times the distance that you traveled, the displacement. Work doesn't care how long it takes for you to travel that distance, just that you get there eventually. And lastly, we have the time component. So power really does care about how much time it takes for you to move an object or yourself through space. So the faster you can move, the more your power output. Or the more weight you can move, the more your power output. They both contribute to your power. So what's the most effective way to train power and speed, but we'll say power in this case. Well, I could give you some exercise to train and that would probably improve your power, but you can already find so many videos out there that do just that. I wanna give you something more than just exercises. I wanna show you how and why these exercises can be so effective if you do them right. With that knowledge, you can start to come up with your own exercises that best fit your needs and your sport. Okay, so to understand power development, we first have to look at how a muscle contraction works. This is a schematic of a muscle from a paper published in 2019 that discusses muscle hypertrophy. And by the way, you can find links to all the papers that I reference and cite in the description below, so check those out. Now, we can zoom into your muscle fibers and eventually get all the way down to a sarcomere. A sarcomere is basically the smallest functional unit of a muscle. Now, inside a sarcomere, you can find two main components. Number one is the myosin, which is a thick filament, and it has these little heads that can actually move. You can think of them as little mini motors. You also have actin, this is the second component. This actin is a thin filament, and it acts almost like a ladder for those little myosin motors to pull on. Now, muscle contraction occurs when those little myosin motors start pulling the actin towards the center, towards each other. This causes your muscle length to actually shorten, which creates a contraction of your muscles. And that contraction pulls your skeleton into a new position. How do those little myosin motors know when to pull, when to do their work? Well, it's when they receive an electrical signal from your nerves. So an example is when you wanna do a bicep curl, your brain will say, okay, muscles, start firing. It'll send a signal all the way down to that muscle group. 
Once that electrical signal reaches the neuromuscular junction, that's what it's called, that's where the nerve attaches to the muscle group. Once that signal reaches that location, it releases a cascade of chemical signals that go all the way down into the muscles, stimulating those little myosin motors to attach to that actin and to pull. Now there are hundreds of these little myosin motors working at any given time, and each myosin motor itself can pull multiple times. It can walk along that actin ladder, basically. So multiply these hundreds of little myosin motors times these thousands of sarcomeres that you have for each muscle group. That's a lot of pulling force. Now, here's where things get really interesting. What happens when you wanna move really fast? You have to contract your muscles quickly, right? Well, what happens to those little myosin motors when you do that? You're sending a powerful signal to that muscle group, telling it to explode into action. As the speed of the muscle contraction increases, the number of myosin motors that have a chance to grab onto that actin drop off. Basically, fewer myosin motors have a chance to grab that actin because it's moving so fast. One paper illustrates this clearly. As the velocity of that actin increases, the number of myosin motors that can attach drop off. Well, why does this matter? I mean, you were still able to move fast, right? But how much weight were you moving when you moved fast? Probably not very much. The more myosin motors you have working together at the same time, the more load your muscle can handle, the more weight you can move. You've probably experienced this at some point when you go to lift something heavy, you might be thinking, oh, it's actually pretty light. So you try to lift it really fast and then you slow way down because you're like, oh, this is actually really heavy. But at that slower pace, you start to lift it. You're starting to move that weight. That's because those myosin motors are getting recruited at once. There's more of them working for you at the same time. So you're able to lift it at that slower pace. Here's another graph from the same paper showing this phenomena. As your velocity decreases, the load that your muscles can handle will increase. Okay, so we know that if we want to move faster, the number of myosin motors that can work for us will decrease, which isn't great when we want to pack a lot of force behind fast movements. But is there a way to counteract this phenomenon? Well, to increase our power, we need to increase the number of myosin that can pull that actin at those faster rates. How do we do that? Uh, well, there are actually many ways to achieve this. Lucky for us. One way is to increase the number of sarcomeres that are available for work. The more sarcomeres you have in a contraction, the more power you're able to generate. Well, how do you do that? How do you add more sarcomeres? Well, you could build more muscle. When you build muscle, you're literally growing more sarcomeres. New sarcomeres are being added on to your muscle group, and that's partly what causes your muscles to appear larger. The more sarcomeres that you have working for you, the more force you're able to generate. But before we go pumping iron like crazy, there's another way. It's increasing the activation of the sarcomeres that you already have. Have you ever seen someone who is ridiculously strong, but they don't seem to have a huge amount of muscle mass? You might find yourself scratching your head wondering how this is possible. For instance, Bruce Lee, the world-renowned martial artist and actor, he maintained a very lean physique, but everyone who crossed paths with him could attest to his incredible strength. But how could he be so strong without having huge muscles? Well, it involves increasing the efficiency of the muscles that you already have. It also has to do with how you train your muscles. So let's start with this one, how to improve efficiency. Let's use what you already have and make it better. And then we'll explore how to build muscle once we've made things more efficient. When you go to do a pull-up, there's a good chance you're not firing all of the muscle fibers currently available for use. Many people will ignore their back muscles entirely and just use their biceps. Others are using their back muscles, but they don't have total awareness and ability to fire all of the usable muscle groups. I know I still can't fire certain muscles in my right trap three area for whatever reason. It's hard to figure out how to fire those muscles when you can't even see them. Now you'd think you could fire all of your muscles on command, right? I mean, it's your body. But try testing it on yourself. 
Start with your bicep. While touching your bicep, contract that muscle and see if the muscle moves at all. Okay, most people can do that one. But now try your calf. While keeping the rest of your muscle relaxed, try only tensing your calf muscle. Jeez, that's a little harder, but I can kind of do it still, okay? Now try your lower back. The lowest point in those back muscles, put your hands there and try tensing that particular location. See if those muscles can move out a little and harden. Yep, that one's a lot harder for people. Now you can progress through the rest of your body to see what other muscle groups are difficult to fire. If you can't activate certain muscle groups on command, then when you go to do an exercise that uses those muscle groups, they'll likely not fire as effectively or efficiently as the surrounding muscles. So they're a weaker link. Your goal is to strengthen that pathway down to those muscle groups you have a hard time firing. One way to do that is to choose some exercises that target that specific muscle group. Incorporate those exercises into your normal training schedule. Also, you could train this neuromuscular connection without even having to go to the gym. You could be standing in line at the grocery store practicing these targeted contractions. Now your focus expression while doing this might make you look a little constipated. So don't be surprised if you get some weird looks. But I still think this is totally worth it because just this mental imagery and the attempt of that contraction has been shown in a number of studies to induce a performance improvement that's comparable to physical training. Yeah, it's that powerful, especially for those who are still learning how to contract those muscles more efficiently. Once you can activate more of the sarcomeres, aka muscles, that you already have, the power you'll be able to generate will increase. You're recruiting more of your muscles at once, which gets more myosomotors working at the same time. While we want to increase our ability in contracting more of our muscles, it's equally important to not waste valuable energy contracting muscles that aren't even helping us in our movement. And it's counterproductive to contract muscles that are pulling in the opposite direction of where we're moving. This seems pretty obvious, right? But you'd be surprised by how many people end up contracting all of their muscles when they're learning a new sport. I see this a lot in mixed martial arts. For instance, people like to punch hard and fast. So they end up tensing their whole body and just start punching like crazy. What they don't realize though is that they're wasting a good chunk of their energy tensing the opposing muscle groups. Not only is that energy wasted in muscles that aren't even needed, but those opposing muscle groups are actively working against you. So it makes it hard to throw a punch. Your punches get really slow and stiff. You end up fighting against yourself more than your opponent. Fight club anyone? But not only is it important to know which muscles to contract, but we also need to practice the timing of our muscle contraction in order to generate force. This is partly how Bruce Lee was able to deliver such powerful punches. His famous one inch punch could send people flying backwards. Many couldn't believe their eyes when they saw it demonstrated. So how did you do it, Bruce? What's your secret? Well, this is how he did it. He was able to generate a wave of muscle contractions up through his body. The wave starts at the feet, your anchor point, and it travels through the body, generating force as it travels. The arm is the final part of the movement, and it carries with it all of the force that was generated through your body. That is how Bruce Lee was able to generate such power. Now, the timing of our muscle contraction requires a surprising amount of coordination and practice. So look at the movements you want to increase your power in and break them down. Figure out what sequence of muscle contractions will help you generate the most force in your movement. You'll want to get these movements hardwired so that there's no conscious thought involved. Once this becomes automatic, your brain no longer has to think about it consciously, which will save you quite a bit of time. If you're curious as to how that works, I explain all of this in some of my previous videos. All of these efficiency improvements require that you get your mind involved and bring a good amount of awareness and coordination to your movements. But also your body is hard at work making improvements behind the scenes. Bruce Lee's strength came not only from his coordination and precise control of his musculature, but also from his muscles adaptation to his training. His muscle fiber type likely shifted after years of rigorous training. You might have heard of fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. If you train fast explosive movements consistently, 
your slower twitch muscle fibers will actually start to change into a faster twitch fiber type. This helps you become more explosive and powerful. If instead you trained cardio in more long endurance sports for many years, then your muscles would shift to become slower twitch and very good at long endurance exercises. So you don't even have to build muscle for this. The very muscle you already have transforms into a different fiber type that's best suited for your kind of exercise. Now these fast twitch muscle fibers are better at utilizing your energy reserves for short and powerful bursts of effort. They're more efficient at utilizing these energy reserves. So you get what you ask for. It shows your body's incredible ability to adapt to your demands. Okay, we've figured out how to make what we already have more efficient. That could be from our mind to muscle communication, or the coordination of our movements, or a transition from one fiber type to another. Now, the second main path to cultivating power is to build sarcomeres, to build muscle. The key thing to remember when you go into your training, this is pretty important, you have to push your body to see adaptations. If you're in a comfortable state, a state of equilibrium, then your body will not get enough stimulus to change. You don't get fast by training at a medium speed. You gotta be pushing yourself to see real growth. Progressively overloading is a big part of this. Progressive overload is what it sounds like. Over time, you progressively increase your load or intensity that you're training at. This could be adding three to 5% more weight to your set every week or so, or it could be increasing the number of reps you do per set, or it could be pushing to increase your movement velocity. So as we go through different training examples that can help you improve your power, keep this progressive overloading in mind because this is one of the keys to helping you see progress. Okay, we're here. What are the best training methodologies to increase your power? Well, it depends on what your goals are. There's always a, it depends, isn't there? Are you training for a sport that requires a quick directional change? Or are you wanting to focus more on creating a powerful explosive punch in a combat sport? This will inform you on what to spend more of your time training. Now, there are many ways to build muscle. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in what path you want to take. For fast changes in direction, one systematic review looked at 20 different studies and found training that targets fast changes in direction offered the best results for improving changes in direction. Shocker. So if you want to improve your ability to change directions quickly, here are some training modalities that you could target. Sprint training, plyometric training, basically a lot of jumping, and targeted resistance training. The resistance training itself should be explosive. It should be fast movement of that weight with, you know, safety. Now, if you want a separate video that goes into each of these in more detail, let me know in the comments and I can give some examples for each of these training modalities. Now, you might be thinking, well, if I get the best at the thing that I train the most, then I should just play my sport. I'll probably see speed and power improvements just from that. Psh, I don't need to do any training. Okay, studies have asked the same question and have concluded that, yeah, while training your sport does give you some benefits, targeted speed and power training gives you significantly bigger improvements in your acceleration, deceleration, power, dynamic balance. It just really helps. You can't get off that easily. So your goal is to isolate specific movements in your sport that you need to increase your speed and power in. Once you've got those figured out, train those with explosive movements and consider adding weight. Push yourself to move as quickly as possible while staying safe through these explosive movements. This will create adaptation in your muscle. And if done right, you should see an increase in your speed and power. How many reps and sets? Well, to build strength, many experts settle on a lower rep scheme, but with higher weight or intensity. So some experts suggest aiming for about three to five reps for between three to five sets with a higher weight or intensity. These are rough guidelines to get you started. So modify as needed, especially as you figure out what works best for you. Now a word of caution, some of these explosive movements are intense on the body. And if your muscles or tendons aren't ready, you could cause injury. Tendon strength takes the longest to build up. 
you know, you can see muscle strength improvements within days to weeks, but tendon strength increases could take weeks to months. But once your tendons get stiffer and stronger, they'll actually be able to absorb more potential energy. In other words, you can load your tendon more and it'll act like a spring and it can actually accelerate you into your movement. We could get more into the muscle fiber types like fast twitch versus slow twitch, or we could also get into the pination angle of your musculature, which can change over time with training. Let me know in the comments if you wanna see any of that material or if you wanna see any other videos covering muscle training. But for this video, I think we've covered enough to get you started. One of the main ways to build power and speed is by increasing the rate and the number of myosin that are pulling the actin at those fast velocities. Now to do this, you wanna optimize two main things, how efficiently you use the muscles that you currently have and growing more muscle and tendon that's well adapted to explosive movements. To get better at using the muscles that you already have, practice contracting the muscles that you have a hard time accessing. You can use targeted exercises to help train those, or you could simply practice flexing those muscles. I guess those bros who flex in the mirror are actually onto something. Hmm. Now the other piece to practice here is the timing and coordination of your muscle contractions, especially in a more complex movement like throwing a ball or throwing a punch. Now these movements shouldn't take any mental thought. This should be hardwired. Some of those videos I made covering reaction times goes deep into how this hard wiring can save you a lot of time. As for training methods, pick explosive movements that you can do reps of. These movements should replicate as best as possible the movements in your sport that require a lot of speed and power. Plyometrics, sprint training, power lifting, and any other agility type training can be great options to explore. Let me know in the comments what type of training you're gonna try or if you've already figured out a good training that's working for you, let us know. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, go ahead and click here. That will get you the latest videos to your feed. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.